Great. Great. So thank you, Java. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this week. Uh, he's a Ying GFA. Uh, he his PhD at Cornell University, working in high dimensional stats, robust stats, lots of cool stuff, uh, uh, advised by Yu Dong Chen. And then he moved on and did a little bit of work on reinforcement learning theory, which is why he's invited uh, to speak here today. Uh, but today he has moved on uh, to do uh, uh, to work as a research engineer at Bloomberg AI, uh, where I suppose he's uh, working a lot of risk management and that sort of stuff. Well, we are really looking forward to his talk on this topic today. Over to the uh, thank you for the very nice introduction, and uh, and I really appreciate that you organized this really fantastic series of seminars. So today I want to present uh, some very exciting progress on this topic called risk-sensitive reinforcement learning. And in particular, I want to focus on three interesting properties uh, that I want to uh, highlight during the talk namely the symmetry, asymmetry, and the risk sample trade-off of risk-sensitive reinforcement learning. Uh, so throughout the talk, these terms will be, uh, will, will be made clear, uh, hopefully. And uh, without further delay, uh, let us get started. So here's a roadmap of this talk. Uh, I will first give a motivation of the problem of risk-sensitive reinforcement learning and uh, especially why uh, risk sensitivity in decision-making process. And second, I would uh, introduce the problem setup and a particular instance of risk sensitive uh, reinforcement learning that we are interested in this talk. And third, we will take a look into the uh, some central properties of the problem, uh, namely the Bellman equation uh, of the problem and Interestingly, it leads to, or it motivates or inspires a uh, novel design of the exploration mechanism for, uh, for algorithms for, for solving this problem. And after that, I will present the algorithms and talk about the central pieces, uh, central components of the algorithms. Uh, and last but not least, I will uh, discuss some theoretical results uh, for the algorithm that I presented. Okay, so again, so why risk sensitivity, uh, and especially in the decision-making process? Um, so f first, uh, risk sensitivity is is crucial in automated systems that have uh, that involve human beings, uh, especially in robotics. Uh, for example, for uh, autonomous vehicles. It carries human beings as passengers, but it also operates in, say, streets that have human beings walking around and also uh, other vehicles. So uh, safety is definitely the first priority in uh, operating such uh, systems. And, uh, and also uh, the robustness of, this, of the systems is also crucial uh, to ensure the norm normal operations. And uh, second, uh, there, uh, research in neuroscience has shown that uh, human beings are either explicitly or implicitly performing risk sensitive reinforcement learning uh, by looking into the uh, brain images of human beings making decisions. Uh, and so the risk sensitive reinforcement learning really gives a pathway to understand uh, brains and also in uh, cognitive studies. And third, uh, risk sensitive reinforcement learning has implications in uh, economics uh, because uh, as we all know, the e economy participants, uh, most of them are risk sensitive and none of them are perfectly rational. Uh, for example, when you know Federal Reserve uh, adjusts interest rates or its balance sheet, it has implication for the entire economy and also the, uh, mar the market particip participants might adjust their risk sensitivity accordingly. And importantly, this has uh, Im interesting implications in macroeconomic dynamics. Okay, there are, uh, so there are certainly many, many more applications of uh, risk sensitive reinforcement learning 
But hopefully these examples have shown you that this problem has wide implications in the broad areas of machine learning, human learning, and the area that bridges these two, uh, namely human-computer interaction. So with these motivations uh, in mind, let us introduce the, uh, the problem set of, uh, formally. So in this talk, we focus on this particular setting uh, called episodic and finite horizon market, uh, Markov decision process. And this environment has several key parameters. Um, here, K, uh, K is the number of episodes. Uh, H is the horizon. S is the size of state space. Uh, A is the uh, size of the action space. R is the set of reward functions. And P is the set of uh, transition kernels. So for, uh, so for, the, for each episode, the environment starts with an initial state. And then uh, as we go along the horizon, which consists of uh, H steps in total, uh, an agent would choose uh, an, an action in uh, corresponding to the uh, current state and then receives an re reward corresponding to the st uh, current state action pair. And then after all these, the environment would transition on to the next state, which is randomly sampled from the transition kernel conditional on the current uh, state, ac state action pair. And this entire process would iterate for uh, k episodes in total. Uh, just for the simplicity of presentation and clarity, we assume that uh, all reward functions, they are um, ranged in uh, from 0 to 1, and they are deterministic. And in, on top of that, we do not assume that we have knowledge of the transcendent kernel, nor do we know, nor do we have access to a simulator of the transcendent kernels. Uh, so this corresponds, corresponds to the, um, the uh, normal scenarios where uh, algorithms are run in a, in, a, in, a, um, in a way that is agnostic of the environment. Okay, so let me, also introduce the particular instance of risk sensitive reinforcement learning that we focus on that is, uh, that is based on uh, the so-called entropic risk measure. When we uh, work with entropic risk measure, uh, we, we want to maximize uh, the value function with respect to policy pi, where the value function is defined as, uh, as in the displayed equations. So it's, uh, it is one of uh, it, it's one over beta times uh, logarithm of the expectation of the exponential uh, rewards. So here, beta is the risk parameter uh, controlling the risk sens sensitivity of the agent uh, of interest, and more on that later. And R H is the reward uh, that is accumulated to start, start starting from uh, step H. And the expectation in the equation is taken with respect to the transition. Uh, we're not taking from reward because remember the reward function is assumed to be uh, is assumed to be deterministic here. If it's stochastic, then the expectation would also be on uh, the, the reward as well. If you still recall um, uh, undergrad statistics I and mean, stuff from undergrad statistics, then you'll see that this is really a cumulant generating function uh, with respect to the norm, uh, randomness in transition. And it's normalized by uh, the inverse risk parameter. Uh, so excuse me, I have a question here. So is this, is this expectation somehow conditional on the current state or is this a marginal expectation? Can you clarify it? Condition on the current state. Condition on the current state, yes. Uh, because the value function will take a parameter uh, of the state, and this state will go into the uh, conditional of the expectation. Right, I see. Okay, thank you. And one distinct property of this value function compared to perhaps all risk neutral value function is that it is nonlinear in the reward function or the cumulative reward function, RH, and it's also nonlinear in the expectation operator. 
which will have uh, very important implications, uh, as we will discuss uh, soon. Uh, besides the value function, we can also define an action value function, which is, which is denoted as Q here. Uh, there is similarly to uh, the value function V. Uh, perhaps trivially, uh, you will, if you do math in your mind, you will find that uh, the value function as step H is is within the, the range of zero and h minus h plus one, which is the same as uh, in the risk neutral reinforcement learning. However, uh, in risk sensitive reinforcement learning, this fact will also bear important implications uh, as we go through the talk. I, I just want to bring this up, uh, you know, as a heads up, as we will uh, see why it is important later. Okay, so uh, we are certainly not the first one uh, considering this problem, uh, reinforcement learn, uh, I mean, risk, reinforcement learning with risk sensitivity. And in fact, there are, uh, the, the first work of this problem actually dated back to uh, this paper called the Risk Sensitive Markup Decision Processes. And if you look more closely, you'll see that uh, the paper was from exactly 50 years from now. So it's been a classical problem for a uh, quite a while. And ever since then, there's a huge body of research focused on, uh, focusing on uh, this problem. Most, most of them focuses on um, you know, analyzing the Markov decision processes itself or uh, algorithms uh, with asymptotic properties properties. Uh, but unfortunately, there's few works that uh, investigate, uh, you know, design efficient algorithms and investigate their finite sample properties, which is exactly this talk will be uh, about. Okay, so back to our main business. Um, in this talk, we will focus on the problem of learning the optimal policy uh, online and here optimal policy is the policy that maximizes the value function that I just introduced. Importantly, uh, again, I just want to mention that we, uh, during the online learning process, we do not assume uh, knowledge of just transitions and we do not assume uh, we have access to any simulator. Uh, so I guess as typical as in online learning problems, uh, we measure the performance of any algorithms uh, by the notion of regret. Uh, regret is really, uh, really just characterizes the difference between the optimal value function, v pi star, and the value function achieved by uh, algorithms at each single episode, which is represented by v pi k here. Uh, K is the index of the episode. Uh, so it, regret really defines the total suboptimality of the algorithm or the learn policy pi K uh, during the learning process. One thing I want to point out here is that different from uh, risk neutral uh, online learning or reinforcement learning, where V, the value function, is just the uh, expectation of the, you know, expectation of the re reward. Um, so, so here, uh, the V, as we define here, is the entropic risk measure, which is a nonlinear function uh, in both the expectation operator and the uh, cumulative re reward. Uh, so ideally, uh, Ideally, we want to design an algorithm that incurs as little regret as possible. And quantitatively, that means we want to regret that it's sublinear in the number of episodes. Uh, and more specifically, we want something, we want to choose a certain bound that is, you know, better than this naive bound, k times h. Uh, why k times h? Because uh, we have k episodes in total. and in each episode, we are looking at the difference between two value functions, each of which is between 0 and h, and therefore the difference is also between 0 and h. So the naive bound will give you the k times h, 
which is not surprising. It's the same as in the risk neutral reinforcement learning. Uh, so um, as we I have introduced the problem setup, uh, let's let's take a look into the central properties of this problem and especially uh, the Bauman equation of the problem and how it motivates and inspires our novel design of uh, exploration mechanism. That would be important to design a uh, you know efficient algorithms for uh, that that has optimal trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So, uh, uh, if you so, so, sorry, Yingji, that, that was a question in the chat uh, mm -hmm. that we are all finding very interesting. So uh, Varun Gupta is asking, uh, so is it clear why the difference of the cumulant generating function is the right notion of regret in this risk sensitive world? So why not take, for example, the cumulant generating function of the regret? Because maybe that would capture the risk a little bit better. So this additive expectation flavored notion is really the right thing or no? It really depends on what kind of risk you want to model in in question. Uh, so here we want to we want to model the risk in terms of you know the learning process and especially learning of the reward. And what we want to achieve is that we want to uh, we want to maximize of this entropic risk measure of reward. Of course, you can also define other kind of regret uh, metric like what you just mentioned. Uh, like entropy risk measure of the difference between, you know, uh, main, uh, you know, standard value functions, but uh, but in our talk we really focus on the uh, you know the risk during the learning process or with respect to the transition and learning the rewards. I hope that, that clarifies the question. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have like a bunch more questions about this later because this is. I think something deep, but maybe maybe Chava also has some questions. Sure. Cool. We, we we can we can save it for later. But uh, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe this part. I'm not sure I understood you well in in regards to but when you said that. Okay, so big picture, which part of the risk do you want to model? And then you said that you want to model the risk related to or like deal with the risk or like be sensitive to the risk related to. The learning process. I thought that you're going to answer the the other that it's the risk related to uh, just coming from that you're interacting with this uncertain world. So that's what these value functions, these risk sensitive value functions, are going to capture. And then there is the added cost on the top of that in terms of the regret of the learner not knowing uh, ahead of time what the MDP is going to be, and then you're kind of worried about that, but not really uh, the risk incurred during learning, right? Like, I thought that Warren's question is is about that, that like, if you are really risk sensitive, then you're really worried about the risk uh, during learning, and then for that, maybe some other metric is uh, slightly more appropriate. Yeah, so that, that's a great follow-up clarification. Uh, we do model the risk during the, uh, I mean, going through the Markov decision process, uh, you know, step by step during the horizon. So uh, we really care about the risk that is induced by the randomness of the uh, transition kernel here. And if, and of course, if you assume the reward is also random, then in addition to the transition kernel, you will also be modeling the risk of the reward. But that's a great question. And uh, thanks for the clarification. Okay. Okay, so um, one so one distinctive properties of risk sensitive uh, reinforcement learning uh, is its uh, Bellman equation. If uh, if you do some quick math uh, on paper, then uh, I mean, which I will not show here due to the uh, space constraint and time constraint, you'll arrive at this uh, Bellman equation that takes the form as the follows. On the left hand side, you still have the action value functions, uh, but on the right hand side, um, you have the reward. But in the second term, you will have the risk, uh, the entropic risk measure of the value function of the next step. Note here um, 
in the second term, we are literally just replacing, uh, if you look into the definition of value function, we're just replacing the, the uh, reward function, the cumulative reward function, by the value function of the next step. So, uh, so in addition to the fact that Bellman equation connects the value functions of the adjacency steps, uh, one crucial thing to note is that compared with the risk neutral Bellman equation, which I listed here, uh, the, the above Bellman equation is both nonlinear in the expectation operator and also in the value function of the next step, which is perhaps not surprising uh, bec because the, uh, our objective is also nonlinear in these two items. Uh, and and the, uh, the reward and the second term, which is the entropic risk measure of the value function, is, uh, is taking an additive structure. Okay, so, so uh, I, I want to say that this is certainly not the, uh, the only way to look at this Bauman equation, especially given that we have logarithm and exponential on the right-hand side. So naturally, you would uh, attempt to, you know, take exponential on both sides of the equation. And indeed, this will actually give an alternative view of the Bellman equation, uh, which we call the exponential Bellman equation. Now, uh, after you take the exponential on both sides, uh, you will arrive at, for the left-hand side, an exponential of the action value function. And on the, uh, on the right-hand side, you will have the exponential re uh, instantaneous reward multiplied by the expectation of the exponential of the value function of the next step. So compared with both the risk-neutral Bellman equation and also the Bellman equation that I just uh, presented in the last slide, this Bellman equation is multiplicative. Notice that uh, multiplicative in the sense that uh, the way the reward function, the instantaneous reward, interacts with the value function in the next step, they are, uh, they are involved by the uh, multiplication. And crucially, uh, it also gives us a Bellman equation in which the action value function is now linear in the expectation operator. And also note that uh, the exponential, the so-called exponential action value function is really the moment generating function uh, with respect to the randomness of uh, the transcendent kernel. And here, uh, here just some basic property uh, to note. When beta is larger than zero, uh, the value function, the, the, the uh, exponential value function with decreases as we go along uh, the horizon, and vice versa for beta uh, less than zero. And beta bigger, le um, larger than zero actually corresponds to the case where, uh, where the agent is risk-seeking, whereas when beta is less than zero, the uh, agent is risk-averse to uncertainty. So uh, I also want to point out that the uh, our exponential Bellman equation is different from taking exponential of the risk neutral Bellman equation. This can be seen uh, if you look at the last two equations on, on this slide, uh, where we are raising, the ex we're raising exponential on both sides of the Bellman equation of risk neutral reinforcement learning. Then you would arrive at on the right hand side, the second term is the uh, exponential of the expectation of the next value function. So here, expectation is actually in the exponent. Uh, in contrast, in our exponential bound equation, the expectation is a linear term uh, in the, uh, the exponential value function. And uh, you might ask, why do we care about uh, taking the ex exponential of both sides of the Bellman equation? At the end of the day, they are equivalent. Well, uh, well to answer this question, I just want to point out that uh, this view of a Bellman equation would actually be uh, crucial to, uh, 
to the uh, design of the exploration mechanism, which will turn, which again will turn out to be crucial to uh, have a you know efficient algorithms that uh, trades off exploration exploitation. Okay, so on to the exploration. Uh, we will we will adopt the uh, the classical approach called optimism in the face of uncertainty, or OFU in short. So with this uh, principle, uh, basically given n past trajectories or past samples, we will try to estimate the exponential value function, that is the uh, e to the beta times q. Uh, now we can derive the estimation error uh, if you do if you just do some careful math, the estimation error will be bounded by the following term uh, in a displayed equation. Here, c is a positive universal constant. Uh, the term in the uh, in in the absolute value is what we call multiplier, and the third term, square root of one over n, is uh, a classical uh, or uh, parametric rate for uh, statistical estimation. Now, uh, now, you, you might ask, why do, how do we arrive at the, the multiplier term? Well, this is because um, when we recall that the, the action value function has the range of 0 and h minus h plus 1. So if you plug these two values into the exponential, you will naturally arrive at uh, the, the, the difference in the multiplier. Now, again, in the uh, in the classical approach of often, of OFU, one would like to deal with the estimation error, uh, both to stabilize the algorithms, as well as to achieve a good trade-off between exploration and of and exploitation by canceling the estimation error. And the way to do this is to augment the value estimator with something called bonus. Here, um, so in risk-neutral reinforcement learning, we usually just add some bonus. Here I use the, uh, the, the term augment, as we will see soon that we're not just adding uh, bonus, uh, but it really depends on whether we are in a risk-seeking uh, or a risk-averse mode of uh, operation. So, um, like I said, if we want to cancel cancel out the effects of uh, the estimation error on our algorithms, so naturally we will set the uh, the so-called bonus term uh, to be equal or on the same order of the estimation error. And this means when uh, beta is larger than zero, uh, the bonus will be proportional to some exponential term minus one. Whereas when beta is less than zero, the bonus would be proportional to some term that is uh, one minus some exponential term. So, uh, and this is achieved just by, you know, getting rid of the uh, absolute value and then uh, rearrange the, 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 the two terms. But very interestingly, um, these, two, these two terms are in fact asymmetric in terms of the risk sensitivity, uh, which is the uh, absolute value of beta here. On the right hand side, I plot out the, the multiplier term for both cases of positive beta and negative beta for various values of uh, beta, and also uh, when the horizon is equal to 10. So as you can see, when beta is positive, the uh, the multiplier decays exponentially fast when uh, when we go along with the horizon. And of course, the larger the beta, uh, the, the larger multiplier it is. However, when beta is smaller than zero, uh, the multiplier also decays, but but in a different way as in uh, in, in the case of positive beta. This is what we call the, uh, this is what we uh, uh, mentioned previously, this is the effect of as asymmetry in the uh, multiplier of the bonus and also the estimation error. 
And this is all induced by the exponential boundary equation that we consider. Now, because that the uh, bonus multiplier decays both in uh, horizon or horizon step and the number of samples, we name this new uh, bonus, the bonus term, uh, the doubly decaying bonus. So, so can I have a question here? So mm -hmm. is, this, is this because you assume the rewards to be in zero one? So what if yes. the rewards are in minus one plus one? If it's minus one plus one, then I would, I would uh, imagine that the exponential minus one term would become uh, the difference of two exponential terms. All right, so then, then it would be just increasing in, in eta. Uh, by increasing, you mean? And you said like e to the plus beta? It, it, it would be. In the positive and negative beta case. Uh, absolutely not beta. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. I see, okay. So, yeah, how come, how come this positive and negative rewards are so important for this formulation. Well, I guess how, how, how come the deposit is so important? Yeah. Not shifting very in this whole thing. Yeah. Okay, okay. I guess we can think about this a bit later. Yeah, cool. Actually, I had a related question earlier. I just didn't ask it, which was that if you only have costs, like, is it is it going to, like, things are behaving quite differently in terms of this? Uh, Policy. So, for example, if I switch from rewards to cost by just negating all the rewards, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I try to find the the corresponding beta, is it like that? Like I need to negate the beta, and then uh, I'm invariant to this, just like a reflection uh, around zero. Is, is that true? Like all, all values are going to be just like reflected around? I would say the, um, it, will be a, it will be a different problem because if you recall the definition of the value function, it, is, it has a one over beta in front of the yeah. logarithm. Right. Even if, uh, it, even if you um, reverse the sign of beta and the, the reward, uh, the, ex, uh, the, the term, the sign on the exponent will not change. But the one over beta multiplier in front of the logarithm would uh, will flip the sign. Yeah. So this will be a different problem, right? And if you ma maximize the value function with respect to the uh, policy, then uh, it will be kind of different. Although I guess when I'm flipping the sign of the reward, it, it mm -hmm. runs from C into cost, and so now I want to minimize. So maybe it's all fine. Like in terms of that, I think if you minimize, then sure. Yeah. yeah so I was wondering about whether there's a difference between the minimization formulation and the maximization formulation, and it appears that there is no difference in terms of that, but mm -hmm. there is still this difference of whether, you know, like you're on one side. Although that that's also very di like it's strange because like why zero plays an important role, uh, the the objective function, if I add the constant to all the rewards, it just shifts by a constant, the same constant, right? Yes, so so in fact, the entropy risk measure is invariant to shifting. Yeah. yeah. So then like, okay, why does zero play an important role here? So uh, yeah, but then the range of the reward would dictate the design of bonus here. Because yeah, that's somehow which I'm not getting. So maybe it should be somehow like normalized that it was first so that they are zero bits or something like, okay, so if we can choose this shift in some way, would there be a reasonable, sensible, logical, rational way of, of shifting the rewards around that works better than other values or like, so we see that like we would get different things here. So that's weird. So I think even if so, if you shift the reward, uh, and even if the bonus, the design of bonus would be different, but the regret uh, may as well be the same as we will see uh, later on, because the regret actually takes a 
quite different form as the bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's that's interesting, and I sort of kind of expected this. At the same time, it's a little bit unsettling that the behavior of the ergotum would be different, <laughs> right? Like the ergotum itself, because the bonus is not invariant, the shifts is not going to be invariant, which is like okay, like okay. We have a lot of ergotums like that, by the way. Like uh, this is not the only case, of course, uh, but generally, right? Like we don't want this. It's kind of funny. So there's something funny going on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Anyways, learning. Just yeah. learning. Cool. So, um, so like I said, um, when we are working with the OFU principle, we want to augment uh, the estimator of uh, the exponential value function. Uh, and so I want to uh, give the, uh, the, the following intuition, where the larger the estimator, the estimator of a Q function is, then uh, the more optimistic we will be uh, in, in the exploration. This is intuitive because uh, the larger value function basically says uh, the corresponding state and action pair is more uh, is more promising uh, to achieve a higher, you know, uh, value function at the end of the day. And this intuition gives the following implications. So when beta is larger than zero, we would actually want to uh, inflate the estimator by adding bonus to the, uh, the, the exponential estimator. And this part is still the same as a risk neutral reinforcement learning where we do uh, add bonus to estimators. Uh, but uh, here, uh, there's a type of when beta is smaller than zero, then we actually want to uh, deflate the uh, exponential estimator by subtracting bonus uh, so that uh, the, the, the end estimator is smaller than the original estimator. And that, that makes sense because when beta is smaller than zero, a more optimistic value function Q would actually imply a smaller uh, value of the exponential estimator. So that means the smaller the exponential estimator is, the better for us and the, the more promising for the uh, state action pair. So in this case, we do want to subtract off the bonus, which is positive, uh, so that the exponential value is made smaller. And because of this uh, distinctive properties compared to risk neutral uh, reinforcement learning, we uh, name this, uh, this instance of OFU, uh, the risk sensitive uh, OFU or, or optimism in the face of uncertainty. Okay, so of course, uh, the, the reason that we care about the bonus is that we want to design some efficient algorithms. Uh, at the end of the day. So in this talk, I would like to present two flavors of efficient algorithms for the problem of risk-sensitive reinforcement learning. One is based on battery iteration, and the other is based on Q-learning. So, so value iteration and Q-learning are essentially siblings, and the main difference is just that in value iteration, um, you, you, you would like to estimate value using simple moving average of past or histo historical samples. Whereas in Q-learning, uh, you would do value estimation uh, via exponential moving average. So uh, let's, get, let's look at uh, the two algorithms uh, one by one. So here I present the risk sensitive value iteration. Uh, Basically, in you know, in, in each episode, in each um, in, in each episode, we execute the Bauman backup, and then uh, in in each step, we uh, we would like to estimate the the exponential value function, and you know, augment it with uh, the appropriate bonus, and then eventually clip the estimator within an appropriate range and then calculate the uh, value function 
so so as to uh, to be used in the next step of Garmin, uh, Garmin backup. And then outside the loop, we will just uh, read really takes the best action according to the uh, you know the the value function. So as I promised, uh, the value estimation step is given by step five, and it's given by a form of simple moving average. Here we are just looking at uh, all past samples from episode one all the way up to uh, k minus one. And uh, we enforce optimism through, uh, through what I just introduced, the risk sensitive uh, optimism in the face of uncertainty. That is, we add bonus when the beta is larger than zero, and we subtract bonus when the beta is less than zero. And then the second algorithm that we would like to con consider is uh, based on Q-learning. And in, in, so instead of doing uh, Bauman backup uh, for, for Horizon individually, we would just synchronously update uh, the, uh, the, the value estimation uh, using exponential moving average. So here, uh, line nine actually gives the uh, estimate the estimation step, uh, where uh, you, you can see that it's, uh, it's a form of uh, exponential moving average with a discount factor alpha. Uh, and here, G is basically the exponential value that is obtained from uh, previous episodes. So we are really mixing uh, the current estimate, which is, which is in the second turn, with the previous uh, estimate, which is given by G. And then as in the value iteration, we would enforce risk sensitive uh, OFU by adding bonus and subtracting bonus uh, respectively. Cool, so uh, given the algorithms, we like to present some uh, really exciting theoretical results for uh, the problems. Uh, but first and foremost, I would like to give a lower bound that characterizes the uh, difficulty of the learning problem under risk sensitive reinforcement uh, and market decision process. So for any, for any algorithm, uh, if you recall the notion of regret, which is the total difference between uh, the optimal value function and the learned value function, you will uh, arrive at a lower bound uh, that, that takes the two uh, components. The first component is uh, an exponential term, which is exponential in both beta and h. Note that this exponential term is different from uh, the, the exponential term in the bonus design, in that it has an extra, it, it takes a denominator of uh, absolute value beta times h. And the second term is, uh, is with respect to uh, the remaining dependence of the regret, namely the square root of the k and some possible polynomial factors in horizon, uh, you know, uh, size of state space and action spaces. Uh, but the, for the interest of our problem, we really focus on the episodes, uh, the episodes which governs the sample complexity in some way and then the, uh, the beta, which is, which is the uh, risk parameter. So as you can see from this lower bound, um, there is a trade-off between the episodes and uh, both risk sensitivity and horizon. And crucially, this regret is exponential in uh, beta and H. And this is the lower bound. So this means the, the risk sensitive reinforcement learning problem that we are considering is actually very challenging. Um, and uh, for, for, uh, for both algorithms, we present the following upper bound, which, uh, which is, I guess, both surprisingly and unsurprisingly takes the, form, uh, the same form as a lower bound. Uh, unsurprisingly, because uh, if it's not the same, then perhaps it's uh, less worth presenting. <laughs> But, uh, but, uh, but I, I want to say that because it takes the same form and especially the exponential, uh, the, the same exponential factor, uh, 
the upper bound is actually nearly optimal compared to the uh, lower bound. Now here comes the surprising part. Uh, if, you, if you look at this exponential factor really closely, you'll see that it is actually a, a symmetric term for positive and negative beta. So that means it's symmetric in terms of risk sensitivity. Uh, here on the uh, uh, upper right side, I plot out the exponential factor in the regret bound for various values of uh, risk sensitivity, uh, absolute value of beta, and then horizon. You see that uh, the exponential, uh, the, the, so this factor in, indeed grows both with uh, beta and H, and it is agnostic of the sign of the risk parameter beta. Uh, so this is the symmetry part, uh, uh, as in the, uh, the the title of the talk. So uh, and then and then I want to mention that when beta goes to zero, as the agent becomes more and more risk neutral, then the exponential factor would actually go down to one, as the picture shows. So we would actually be able to recover a risk neutral regret bound. That is uh, that is standard in the literature. And, uh, and now recall that we have a naive regret bound that we introduced uh, a few slides ago, that is k times h. So given that uh, our, uh, the, the, the bound we present here is exponential in beta and h, and it's uh, sublinear in k, we demonstrate that, uh, we demonstrate a trade-off and, and actually a nearly optimal trade-off in view of the uh, lower bound between a risk sensitivity and uh, sample complexity, which is governed by k here, uh, by, by the order of uh, k here. OK, as we, con as we come to the conclusion of the talk, I just want to uh, mention a few take takeaways or uh, highlights of this talk. So we have considered the problem of risk-sensitive reinforcement learning, uh, and in particular with respect to the entropic risk measure. And we introduce a distinctive, distinctive property or component of this problem, namely the exponential Bellman equation. And then we present two algorithms, uh, which are both efficient, uh, that are equipped with this novel exploration mechanism called uh, W.D. Cambones. Last but not least, uh, with all these uh, with all these results and findings, we are able to achieve a, a set of nearly optimal regret bounds uh, by the algorithms. So uh, just for, uh, just in case that you're interested in further uh, works uh, and research in this uh, direction, I present several related works to, the, to, to this talk. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your attention and your time uh, to this presentation. And thank you. All right, thank you very much, very nice. Thank you very much, it was great. Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, I guess there were like quite a few well, very philosophical questions uh, during the talk. I guess uh, we can we can get back to those at some point. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess I'm just wondering about a few things first because we, we could like before we get to like all those deep questions. So your upper bounds and lower bounds, well, they depend well somehow, but not exactly exponentially, but let's say roughly exponentially on this beta, but can you give me an intuition as to why the problem is actually become hard, becoming harder as beta increases? Um, I think one way to uh, think about it is that as beta increases, the exponential value functions also increases. Uh, oh, if you, if you look at the positive beta, that is, and because our algorithm really works by estimating the exponential, uh, the exponential value function, 
the estimation error also increases so that you would end up with uh, uh, end up with a, a larger regret. And here, the, because the regret is really uh, is really a, 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 like a, a metric of est uh, of you know looking to the quality of the estimation. So uh, I think this is one of the intuition that I had of why it increases exponentially. Yeah, so, so, I, so I do understand why it shows up in the upper bound, because you are estimating the exponential value functions. So like all the estimation there is going to scale with e to the beta. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering more about the lower bound, I guess, as to why that has to depend on beta. So like what makes the problem like intrinsically harder as beta increases? Like, I don't know, like what's your feeling about this? So, so I, still I think that uh, actually in, in, in the proof of our lower bound, we also focuses on uh, some kind of difference between you know the optimal exponential value function and uh, the exponential value function induced by some kind of algorithm. So uh, again when the estimation error is involved uh, there would give you the uh, the ex the actual exponential factor in front of the square root of k uh, if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah i'm trying to process this so, so can you maybe just go to your lower band yeah. um, so first of all i guess i'm wondering about the nature of this lower band that does it say that for any algorithm and for any beta, there exists a hard problem for which the regret is lower bound by this and that? Or for any algorithm, this lower bound is going to be achieved on the same example or for all beta simultaneously? So this would be for uh, any, uh, any algorithm. Uh, and so, so here we do have some technical um, some technical assumptions on, imposed on beta. So it's definitely not for any beta, but uh, at least for some non-trivial range of beta, you will get the uh, you will get this exponential factor. And does it does it include like very large betas as well? This includes very large beta, yes. And and intuitively, actually when beta is small and when beta is close to zero, you would uh, end up with some risk neutral agent right so the intuition would tell you that uh, you would get some risk neutral lower bound uh, so this ex exponential factor would only be valid for large enough beta here i see yeah yeah that is that is the sensible range i agree that for small beta you just go back to like the usual right stuff yeah so i guess no i'm just i'm just trying to understand like the hardness of uh, of large beta because essentially if you said beta large then what you're trying to optimize is like the either the very best case reward, right? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to like estimate the best case reward, like no matter how small probability that has. Exactly. You you figure out what that is, and basically that is becoming like more and more impossible. As you exactly. Think. Yes, that's the correct intuition. And and the same thing with negative beta, where you have to like optimize for the very worst case for the very yep. worst. Yep. worst. That's very cool. So is there a specific value for the probability that depends on the beta that kind of shows up in here? For the, for the lower bound, we consider the expected lower bound. Uh, so there's no probability uh, whatsoever. But in the upper bound, uh, this is actually a high probability upper bound. Uh, and I just hide uh, the, the term that is uh, with respect to the probability. So rigorously guess... speaking, I guess my question was uh, simpler than that. Uh, I, I imagine that you could just have you know, like two actions or something like that, a single state, mm -hmm. and one of the actions has some probability of incurring a large reward, but this probability is small. Mm -hmm. Then if you didn't try this action many, many times, you won't see this, and the other action is just a neutral action. Mm -hmm. uh, so now uh, there is some limit of like how small probability you need to detect to be able to see some gap in the mm -hmm. value functions with a certain value for a beta. And I was wondering about whether 
you can tell me the range for the probability. Uh, I guess like I can work it back from the uh, lower bound. It, it probably gives me the right range, <laughs> right? Like the, the inverse of like what, what we see over there under the root is kind of like the range of the probability that really needs to be there. Uh, smaller probabilities than that won't matter because you have an expectation, but that, that probability is, is still critical and and you need to try that action sufficiently often. So it's like if you if you try to prove, I guess, uh, the lower one not for MDP is too complicated just for bandits, then this would be maybe some argument. So I I totally agree with you, and I I think what you're talking about is instant dependent um, problem, and uh, I guess you're looking for some instant dependent uh, regret bound. Uh, which indeed should have some uh, should you know inversely correlated with the gap, uh, but the, in, in this talk we just focus on the more general problem, which uh, is instance uh, agnostic. I, so, I, I was I was trying to make another step of like tuning the instance parameter so that it it becomes the worst case for a given value of beta, but like it's otherwise yeah absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. So yeah yeah. yeah. I guess, do you have slides about the lower bound? The lower bound is here. Okay, so not not a proof. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, then then we just look at a paper. Yeah. Uh, okay. I do have a bunch of questions, but maybe other people should come first. Kankan had a question. I think that that's a simple question. I did have the same question. Kankan, do you want to ask it? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, my question is, uh, uh, you mentioned the, in the kind of there's a uh, doubling, doubling decaying uh, bonus. So I wonder where, I only see the decaying uh, caused by the exponential function. I didn't see the other one. So can you remind me what is the other cause uh, of decay? So the other decaying is in the number of uh, past samples, uh, which will be the uh, visitation count of the corresponding state action pair. Uh, and th this value is given by n here. Uh, notice that uh, this is the third term in the bonus definition, uh, which is the parametric rate of uh, st statistical estimation. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. So yeah. Um, okay. I did have some clarification question about this asymmetry of the bonus, uh, mm -hmm. that you're subtracting the bonus. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that like looking at the pseudocode of the ergotum, mm -hmm. and then you said it, uh, you're estimating the exponential value function. Correct. And the, the actual value function would have a negative sign because of the beta, if beta is smaller than one, right? When you say so, the actual value function, yeah, yeah, so in the one over beta times log the exponential of the uh, eta times to the return. So that's the actual, like I call that the actual value function or whatever. I, I see, I see. Uh, so, yeah, so there is a difference there in sign, right? And so, yes, we want to maximize that value function, but if mm -hmm. you take away the one over beta, mm -hmm and beta was negative, then no, we want to minimize. So no, yes. of course we want to subtract. Yes. Is that what's going on? Okay, good. Yeah, yes. I think that that's what's going on. Okay, yeah. good. All right. I and the, yeah. Good. yeah, so actually, uh, because, let me see if I have, yeah, I, I have, your, uh, let me see if I, yeah, so, so we call it Q function, as you said, the, the usual value function is always positive. So when beta is smaller than zero, then, uh, the exponential value function will actually decays in the uh, Q function. So uh, this is exactly the intuition that you mentioned. Yeah. Although I think I, what I would mention is that like the actual value that you want to maximize is one over beta times the log. Log mm -hmm. is monotonic, one over beta changes the sign. So now you want to minimize if uh, beta was negative. Yes, yes. So, okay. Yeah. Um, Regarding this lower bond, I, I was wondering whether it, like, you know, other people and like maybe US value were thinking about 
uh, whether the horizon dependence is real or not. Uh, so we could have a more refined analysis there, maybe. Uh, so my question would be, if it's not the horizon, uh, but we allow, I don't know, problem classes where you have additional regularity, like total reward is mm -hmm. bonded between zero and one or something mm -hmm. like that, some normalization, then do you, do you expect the horizon to disappear from there as well? And, I would. Uh, I, I do expect the horizon would uh, would disappear from the exponential factor. Yeah. Okay. The yes. same way as in the risky neutral case. Yes. Okay. So I I do have one yet small question, uh, which is that looking at the pseudocode of the argotum, mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you can go there. Yep. Uh, one uh, one thing that one might try, uh, beta goes to zero should give us back to the risk neutral case. But can I run this argotum with uh, beta zero? Like, is there a limiting uh, version of the argotum? Like, I, I take beta goes to zero for every uh, step in the argotum, then uh, funny things are happening. So yes. what, what is going on? When beta when beta is super small, um, I, I I would actually uh, advise caution for running the algorithms because of numerical possible numerical issues. You you might run into the uh, the exponential factor very close to one, so that the error would be super super small. Uh, th this might cause numerical issues, but theoretically, in risk in this uh, in this problem we forbid beta to be zero. Uh, this is because if you remember the, the, the usual value function, the definition of usual value function, it has a one over beta in front of the logarithm. So we cannot allow beta to be exactly zero. I guess like we can always take the limit of beta goes to zero as long as we have both the log and the exponential uh, and canceling out each other's effect when beta goes to zero. Uh, but yes. if, if the algorithm only uses the exponential at one point, and then later on maybe uh, patches things with adding a log, mm -hmm. so these these terms become separate. So I was wondering whether there is a a nice way of kind of like would be to write the algorithm in such a way that the separation doesn't happen, and we can like that would maybe be the same as like just worry about whether we can avoid numerical instabilities in mm -hmm. your words uh, when running this algorithm for, for a small beta. So ha have you thought about this? Yeah, this is an interesting uh, point. And uh, honestly, I haven't thought much about that, uh, but it's definitely um, one really interesting direction that uh, that could be future research. OK. Yeah. All right. OK, I'm done. Very cool. All right, so maybe it's time to get off the record and, and get into all the hard questions that have been uh, building up uh, over over the hour. Uh, so I don't know, Kamiar, are, are you still here? So you can ask a question now. 